When we were young parents, we investigated the child care facilities thoroughly. When it was time to select a school, we did the same. We kept an eye on their friends to make sure they didn't fall into trouble. As children of aging parents, we helped them find the best retirement communities and assisted living facilities. Why then, when our loved one dies, do we not investigate the crematory facilities and their practices? The same should be done then. We should not sacrifice quality for price. You have one opportunity to honor your loved one. At Lake Ridge Chapel and Memorial Designers, it matters. All right, good evening. If, uh, if you're not aware of who I am, I'm Santos Marino, the owner of Lake Ridge Chapel and Memorial Designers. Not a very important position here. It's just the person with the ideas, but if it wasn't for our magnificent staff to put this presentation together, um, it wouldn't be possible without them. I'm gonna keep this brief. Of course, you know you're at the cremation symposium. We have several speakers that'll be talking about various topics and uh, that's related with cremation. I also have set out some uh, notepads for you to write down questions so that we don't have to stop in between each segment or each subject to answer any of your questions. Instead, what we're gonna do is afterwards, you'll remember what question you had because you wrote it down. You'll be able to ask any of the panel that's up here and you'll be able to ask any questions that you might have and we'll try to answer them to the best of our knowledge. I want to introduce Dr. Greg Havlock. He is gonna take the presentation of this and introduce the next speaker so that you're able to uh, know who's getting up to speak and the subject they're gonna be talking about. Thank you and I appreciate all of you being here. Thank you, and as Santo said, I'm Dr. Greg Hawlock. I come from Abilene, Texas. I've been working in this business since about 2001. Um, but since we're having a cremation symposium, I thought it would be worthwhile to give you a little bit of history about cremation, where it came from, how it began, and that type of thing. So basically, there are debates today whether burial or cremation is the best choice for a disposition of a body. That debate has gone on for quite some time, but what we have found is that it is cyclical. If we look back in history, we see that whether people choose cremation or burial depends on the time and the era. For instance, scholars agree that cremation began in Europe about 3000 BC. That's in the Stone Age in Europe with the Western uh, Slavic Russians. Sometime after that, it started to spread, and it spread across northern Europe, and it, in 25,000 to 1,000 BC, it continued to spread through Spain, Portugal, the British Isles, and then we started to see cremation cemeteries pop up in Hungary, in Northern Ireland, and then in, let me make sure I get my dates right, I'm trying to keep the facts straight, but what we have found is that the cremation has been cyclical. It has gone up, it has gone down. It was only after that, with the rise of Christianity, when the Emperor Constantine came about, that, the, that we saw a sharp increase in ground burials, a decrease in the cremation. Now, it was still a very common practice among the Romans, um, but early Christians thought that cremation was pagan. Around 400 AD, earth burial was the most popular thing, and it remained popular for the next 1,500 years. Now, cremation as we know it to today, what we think about today when we talk about cremation, really started about 100 years ago. In North America, the first crematory was put in in 1876 in Washington, Pennsylvania. Then in uh, 1900, there were about 20 crematories in operation. In 1913, there were about 52. And it's continued to grow since then. 
the National Funeral Directors Association of America has estimated uh, that in 2013, about 45% of Americans were cremated. And it's gone up since then. So what are some of the reasons why people choose cremation? There are practical and there are personal reasons why people choose to be cremated. Now, choosing what happens to our body after we pass is an important and a very personal decision, but there are many misconceptions about cremations and burials. So I want to talk a little bit about some of those misconceptions so that you're aware of those things. Maybe uh, one reason you're here is so that you learn some of the facts about cremation and burials. Funeral expenses or funeral differences for a family will depend on the type of service they choose, whether they want to be buried or cremated. It also depends on the type of services they want, as well as the final disposition, cremation or burial. Now, there is very little transactional dif difference between a direct burial or an immediate burial or a direct cremation. If you're looking for an easy and quick way to get rid of a body, you can do a direct cremation or a direct burial and, and it's done. There is very little difference in cost between the two, okay? But most people choose to have some type of plan or some type of service. So cremation, another misconception is that with cremation, it gives your family more time to plan for a service. Well, while it is true that you can hold a cremated body indefinitely and you can do whatever, whenever, but what most people may not know is you can also hold a body, an embalmed body, for a significant amount of time so that your family can come together to be able to see their loved one one last time to say goodbyes and plan a service. So one does not necessarily give you more time than the other. Obviously, uh, yes, we do need to do a, an interment for a, an embalmed body, but we can hold those for a significant, significant amount of time. Now, funeral arrangements can also be very personal. You know, for some, it's an extension of maybe their religious beliefs, and people often put a lot of thought into their services. However, some people think I just want it to be simple and I don't want to put a burden on my survivors. This is a misconception. One reason we believe this is so is that it is important, one, to understand and to express your desires for a cremation and to understand and have your survivors understand why you want that so that they understand. It makes a difference for them. Now, spirituality, some people see cremation as kind of a spiritual part of why they, how they want to be disposed of their final disposition. It, you've heard the saying, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So a lot of, they, they may want to have their body cremated or they may want to be buried, but if they're cremated, some people choose to scatter, scatter their ashes into the wind or in the ocean at a park, in the backyard, or, or maybe some other significant place. But one of the things that we have found with scattering is when you only scatter the cremated remains, this does not give your survivors a specific place to go to mourn and grieve the loss of their loved ones. So keep that in mind when you think of these things. Now, another thing that I want to look at is the misconceptions and maybe even misrepresentations about environmental problems between cremation or burial. Now, some argue that caskets are not completely biodegradable. Well, some caskets are made of steel. They'll rust eventually, I guess. But here's the thing. Caskets are buried in a designated place called a cemetery, right? And if a person is that worried about it, we do have wooden caskets, okay? Now, others argue that embalming is bad for the environment. Now, do you know 
that the chemical used for embalming is also used in other products. Formaldehyde is used in building materials. For instance, glue, plywood, fiberboard, insulation, <coughs> particle board, paneling, and guess what? It's also used in everyday common household products such as, get ready, <laughs> Lotions, okay, uh, shampoos, sunblock, soap bars, I do hope somebody used that today, <laughs> cosmetics, body wash, toothpaste, baby wipes, well, that's a good start to life, and bubble bath. I mean, so, but people will hide these things in their products and be sure to point that out in others. So it's a misconception when they point to one thing over the other. Now, cremations are environmentally safe is also a misconception. Just like burial, there are little things that cremation causes as well. For instance, when a body is cremated, the dental fill fillings create a mercury emission into the air. Did you know that? And secondly, it takes a lot of fuel, a lot of energy, just to cremate bodies. So there are downs to both, and there are positives to both. Now, another misconception is there simply isn't enough room to bury the world's population. They don't live in West Texas, do they? <laughs> you know, one of these really they do have some environmental things almost everything we do we leave a human footprint right but one of them affects the ground the other affects the air so i mean these are reasons why you need to take a uh, take a look at what you believe and how you feel about that there's three main ways that they handle the body the cremated body the first one is burial or as we call it interment there are cemeteries that have special Sem uh, cremation spaces, there's mausoleums, there's uh, columbariums. You can be buried in an adult space at a cemetery. And some cemeteries allow a second rite of interment where you can be buried in a casket with someone else. They obviously probably need to go first. <laughs> <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the second way is some families will return the, retain the cremated remains in an urn called inurnment. In that case, they find a very decorative urn and the family members take it home with them. Scattering is the third way. Some families choose to scatter the cremated body in multiple places or one place or they'll scatter some and they'll take some home. Now, whatever your choice, whether it's burial or cremation, it is the most important to consider the needs of your family for mourning after the service, after a loss. You know, burial and cremation is not the only choice that is important. Um, loved ones, your loved ones, your survivors, will most likely need these things. M what we have found is that most people need to see or touch the body of their loved one. They have to they have a dedicated time to come to the terms of the loss and their grief. They need to understand the pain of their loss. They need to remember the one who has died. They need to develop a new sense of identity. They need to search for meaning. And they need to engage your support system to have their friends around them, whether it's a funeral service, a visitation, a memorial service. You know, opting to skip a funeral or a memorial could have lasting repercussions on your survivors. Now, here are things that we know for certain. History shows us that cremation is cyclical. So are burials. That sometimes they're popular, sometimes they're not. People choose burial and cremation based on many different practical and personal reasons. Survivors need a way to express their grief and to begin the healing process. Funerals have been a rite of passage for as far back as you want to go in history. And humans have the need to honor life and the memories of their loved ones 
since the beginning of time. Uh, Mark Childs comes from San Angelo and he's been working in the funeral profession for 28 years, so I'd like to welcome Mark. So good to see everyone here. And um, you know, it's interesting that uh, as we look and see some of the different things that uh, we're talking about this evening with cremation, seems to be something that's going on quite a bit nowadays and people thinking about it. Um, and Greg touched on a number of things that are very important to, uh, to keep in mind. But uh, one of the things I was going to talk about in particular to start off with was the psychology behind making a decision, period, as to what someone does. Uh, because in some cases, people just, they just can't quite comprehend their loved one being cremated. And that's, that's not surprising, is it? Because it's so final when, when, that, uh, when that occurs. But there is a process that goes through because you have various situations that people think about. I'll share one with you, my mom. Uh, we had, um, being in the profession I am, I had set up for uh, some uh, mausoleum crypts for uh, her and my dad to be uh, entombed in. Had all the, everything set up for the uh, funeral service. And then when my dad passed away, we go to the cemetery and we're looking, we go out to look at the, um, the place where the inurnment or the um, casket's going to be placed in the mausoleum. She looks up and immediately says, no, I can't do that. She could not put him up in that spot. So, now what? So we ended up making a change. We went actually to, believe it or not, that worried her more than being cremated. So we made arrangements for my dad to be cremated and we changed the property that we had to uh, a niche by the water um, at the cemetery where she's at down in the Houston, where he was at down in the Houston area. And um, so we made that change and, um, but we still had the funeral service that was very important to still have the funeral service. Because I was thinking in my back of my mind, let's see, now what are my aunts and uncles going to think about this? Especially my aunt that's my, that was my dad's sister and his brother. Because burial was it. That was it. Well, guess what? The fact that we continued to have the service and everything else that went with that, they were okay with that because it was a form of disposition. And so, we were able to go ahead and take care of all the arrangements and get everything situated that way, but it was all a psychological thing at the very last minute that just hit my mom in that particular situation. So we have to really think about how things affect individuals. Um, not everybody is, can go that route. But when we think about the other aspect about cremation and, uh, and, and that situation, some people do have a fear of being buried in the ground. And over the years, I've, ha I've run across individuals that come out, I, I, I can't do that. That's, well, that's, they're alive. <laughs> while they were alive, yes, they were thinking, I can't do that. And I said, well, well, it's not right now. <laughs> we'll give you a minute or two. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> but, um, but we gave them some time to, <laughs> to make their arrangements and get things situated. But it was a, but it was, you know, a decision that they just, they could not do that. And, uh, and, and so everybody has a different way of thinking uh, about, the, uh, about being cremated. And that's where a lot of this comes in, is our making our decisions ourselves on how we want things to be done, not leaving it up to the family. And we'll get into more of that. But as far as the, um, the objections and things of that nature, that's to be expected with, with families. Some families more so than others uh, accept that. But then when it comes to scattering, well, that, come, that falls into a different category, doesn't it? Uh, in the state of Texas, as a matter of fact, the uh, laws in Texas, which I was surprised this was the case in Texas, it says, if you wish to scatter ashes, Texas law allows you to do so over uninhabited public land. Did not know that. Did y'all know that? Mm. Over a public waterway or sea, or on the private property of a consenting owner. Don't go sneaking across somebody's property and <laughs> he didn't like dad. <laughs> now he's got to live with him. 
And then, of course, um, unless the, um, and then when it comes to containers, it says, unless the container is biodegradable, you must remove the ashes from the container before scattering. And so that's, that's very important to do also. And uh, keep in mind that cremated remains are not quite like the ash in your fireplace. You see these movies and they throw the stuff out and it just floats away. Don't expect that. So um, anyhow, so scattering um, is, is something that, um, that is okay in, in Texas at different places. Just be mindful where you're putting those, those uh, cremated remains and make sure you're not uh, uh, getting on, on someone that uh, causes a problem. You see a lot of them at golf courses. They always have every tree that's out there, or sand trap, or somebody dug something and put it there, right? <laughs> so yeah, that happens. <laughs> their foursome is now a threesome. <laughs> but they still have their, four, their fourth with them, right? <laughs> All right. Um, and again, we talked about people being uh, uh, not quite comfortable with the um, uh, with burial in a lot of situations, and, and that is true. There, I have run across that a number of times, and, and sometimes people are afraid to go in the ground, and then they might choose a, a mausoleum, something above ground, um, but there's options that are there. The key is we talk about that with our family, we talk about that as a husband and wife, and we don't just leave that up to the decision of others, because um, that's, uh, that's not the polite thing to do or the, or the loving thing to do. We want to make sure that they have the opportunity to hear what our wishes are. At the same time, these are our wishes, and uh, this is what we want to do. Um, so when we want to uh, cope with all these situations, it's important then that we have the conversation of a lifetime. Make sure we visit with our children to have that conversation and uh, let them know uh, how, you know, how we truthfully feel about situations. Uh, that's just something that you can't put off on someone else. I can't tell you how many times families come into a funeral home, we don't know what mom or dad wanted. We don't have a clue. Dad always said, you can put me in the bag and throw me in the backyard. <laughs> Where'd they come? The funeral home? They're not throwing him in the backyard, are they? No. And by not having that conversation and setting up the things that you want, what are they going to do? Well, I'll tell you. I'm looking around, hopefully we don't have, maybe, okay. Sometimes you'll have several children. One's the one that never was around, always feel, you know, and then all of a sudden when the death occurs, they feel guilty. And so when they come to the funeral home, they start saying, well, you know, we need to get the best for mom or dad. Why? Because they feel bad about the way they treated things, so they think they're going to be able to offset some of that. Well, guess what? You wanted to make arrangements and have things situated in such a way that they could take care of the way you wanted it to be done. You didn't necessarily want them to spend everything that you had on that funeral. Make the decision. Don't, don't leave that up to, to the kids to make that decision without having any understanding whatsoever. And so we can see the importance of going ahead and, and making sure that we have uh, uh, plans lined out, and especially when it comes to cremation, uh, it's important to have things. But uh, there are several things that can happen if you, if you perhaps are not using a reliable funeral facility. Um, there's a family, um, a lady, the uh, Victoria family, they sued a funeral home for $50 million. And you might wonder, well, why was that? Right there. Um, what was the case? Well, in their $50 million lawsuit, the family of the deceased Victoria woman is blaming a funeral home for wrongfully cremating her, lying about it, and making it impossible for her last wishes to be fulfilled. And Roberta Salazar's uh, children will never have a sense of closure when it comes to their mother's death and it's because of the neglect and deceptive acts of Grace Funeral Home, said an attorney. Um, Gary, who is representing the Salazar family, is seeking $50 million in damages from the funeral home for causing emotional distress, breaking a contract, and intentionally committing deceptive trade practices according to a lawsuit filed Monday in Victoria County. And uh, Gary and his clients claim Grace Funeral representatives 
uh, not only cremated Salazar, but also gave her remains to another family, who then buried her mistakenly. Okay. So according to the statement issued uh, by the funeral home's representative on a Tuesday, the business never attempted to deceive Salazar's family, but instead investigated the mistake and apologized. Very comforting to the family for that situation. <clears throat> So they have to be very mindful of who they've got in the house, don't they? It's very important um, because that was someone's loved one that got misplaced throughout the situation. The Denver Post, y'all may have remembered hearing something about the uh, stuff in Georgia years ago. The um, guy that had a crematory out by a lake. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, here's one from the Denver Post. Um, a Colorado family expected to receive cremated remains of their loved one. Instead, they got concrete mix. It says, the Colorado regulators have suspended the license of, the, of a Montrose funeral home that also hosts a connected business selling hmm, human body parts after state officials investigated an incident in which the funeral home was supposed to return cremated remains to a family, but instead of ashes, gave the family cement. In the suspicion order uh, for the uh, sunset, sunset Mesa funeral director says the funeral home and crematory didn't keep required cremation records for at least five years and also didn't keep records documenting the final disposition of human remains for at least seven years. So, in case you're wondering, the deal in Georgia was very similar. The, uh, the gentleman that owned the crematory claimed, well, it didn't work. So he just, he owned a little, had a pond, had other things, and, and people were just left where he wanted to. And his thinking was, well, they, they were just gonna be cremated, so they didn't care about their loved one. <coughs> that was his thinking. But that's not the case, is it? That is not the case. They wanted, all those families wanted their loved ones cremated remains uh, back again and not just to be uh, left someplace. But now we talked about, and I think uh, Greg had mentioned something about urns earlier. Sometimes families, when they have a cremation, they'll have an urn. And um, there's sort of a life cycle with urns. Did you know that? There is. If, if they don't go somewhere, in a niche or something of that nature, the first place they go is usually up on a, on a mantle <laughs> at the house where it sits for about five years. And then it gets moved closer to the coffee table. And then the next thing you know, after a 10 year period now, you got the first five up on the mantle, another five there. Then all of a sudden they get you know, put somewhere where um, individuals can, the other family members can take them off someplace else and they take a journey. So we have to be careful. We wanna make sure that they go someplace. And um, I recall one time I had a um, young man who uh, came into the cemetery and he was looking for his grandfather's space. And this goes to another direction of, aside from the urn. He was looking for his grandfather. We looked up the records, and guess what? His grandfather had been scattered. And at that time, this particular cemetery just scattered, had a spot that they scattered out on the open ground. And the grandson was sort of heartbroken because he says, the thing I miss is I don't have a place to come and remember my grandfather. There was not a marker, there was nothing there. Just the fact that he had been scattered in a particular area. And that's what happens sometimes with the scattering as well. Um, we may know, you know, we got this special place we want to go and then we scatter, but for future generations, they don't know that situation. And sometimes then they look for a place to go and even if it's an, a name on a wall someplace, it's something that, that they can remember and, and is very special to them to go back and, re and reflect on, at different times. So we want to make sure that um, we don't use um, 
that scenario of um, you've heard of the rock, paper, scissors, and who's going to win? Well, who's going to have the urn? Where's it going to go? That's, we want to make sure we have some definite plans for that if, if that's the case of, uh, of what we do. Then we also appreciate the uh, cremation facilities. And I think, um, there we go. So there's a difference between a um, cremation facility, which you'll see over here. That's where you want to go pick up your loved ones. That's just a facility. Um, and then, of course, you have a funeral home that you can go. Here, they happen to have a crematory right down the hallway. Or you can join all the other folks because that funeral home that was in Georgia that didn't look much better than this place, there were funeral homes from all around the area that sent their cremations <coughs> there to be conducted by that funeral home. And then the cremated remains would be sent back to the funeral home or they would come and pick them up. Here, a loved one never leaves the care of this funeral home. They're always here. And that's very important to think about as far as um, when, when we're looking in a situation of, uh, of uh, needing to take care of uh, the uh, cremation of a loved one. So there's a couple things that this firm has chosen to do to help ease the comfort of families during a time of loss, uh, no matter what they, their, their situation is. But um, here's a, one of their deals, a cremation uh, with confidence guarantee. It says, due to national scandals, we understand that those who choose cremation might have doubts about the process and the procedures of the crematory. Our 10-step cremation process guarantees that your loved one is well cared for at all times and that the cremated remains returned to you are those of your loved one. And so they want to make sure that you understand the significance of what this. This is a cremation symposium uh, scenario. And not that everybody will, will take those options, but we just want you to understand the importance of, of using a facility that you can have trust in, in uh, taking care of your loved ones and providing you the care and the comfort that you're going to need in the future. Now, I think there's a short video that goes with this. If you are considering cremation as your choice for final disposition, you need to know the facts when choosing a funeral home to carry out those wishes. Not all crematories are created equal. It is imperative that you know what to look for when making this decision. Cremation is growing in popularity. Likewise, so is the overwhelming controversy and scandals surrounding this age-old, yet what is considered to be a non-traditional practice. The first thing that you want to research is the location of the crematory itself in relation to the funeral home. Many funeral homes do not own their own crematory and rely on third-party location to cremate for them. This is a huge open window for misidentification and mistakes. Therefore, an on-site crematory is of the most importance. At Lake Ridge Chapel and Memorial Designers, our crematory is located in-house and is used exclusively for the families we serve. In addition to the location of the crematory, it is important to inquire about the maintenance and cleaning procedures of the cremation chamber. The industry standard recommends that the chamber be swept after every cremation, but only vacuumed to remove excess remains and debris once per month. At Lake Ridge Chapel and Memorial Designers, we do not agree with this recommendation and believe the only practical solution to properly reduce the commingling of remains is to vacuum the chamber thoroughly following every cremation. This is a very important and valuable step that is bypassed by other funeral homes as they focus on quantity and mass volume rather than the quality of service and peace of mind. We welcome anyone who would like to view our facility to do so at any time. Please keep in mind that just because the crematory is owned and operated by the funeral home does not mean that there is no room for human error concerning identity. With this in mind, we have developed a system of checks and balances to protect the families we serve. 
This protocol is referred to as Cremation with Confidence, and we are the exclusive providers of this service. Cremation with Confidence is our 10-step process that guarantees your loved one is well cared for at all times and that the cremated remains returned to you are those of your loved one. The process begins with the fact that your loved one never leaves our care. Because our crematory is nestled in a peaceful setting just down the hall from our chapel, you can rest in knowing that your loved one is cared for by our cremation specialists from the time of their arrival through which time you receive their remains. Upon transfer of your loved one to our facility, a witness of removal document is signed to verify your loved one's identity, and a personal identification ban is placed to track your loved one through the cremation process. Once your loved one has been bathed and dressed, they will be placed in one of our staterooms for a family viewing for identification. This step is most important for two reasons. One, this viewing by the family or a representative is a crucial part of the identification process. Secondly, this time allows the family the closure they will need to say their final goodbyes. During this visit, we use the state-of-the-art last touch software to scan your loved one's fingerprint. This is done in front of the family and is time and date stamped for added accuracy. Two members of our funeral home staff will double check that all cremation paperwork, permits, and authorizations have been received and properly documented. Once the viewing for identification is complete, one of our memorial designers will discuss with the family the desired level of participation during the cremation process. We also allow our families to be as involved as they would like to be and go as far with this process as they wish. Our ceremonial room is used for these purposes. Just prior to the cremation, a second scan of your loved one's fingerprint is taken. It is only when we obtain the exact match that we continue with the cremation process. The biometric report and tag are placed outside the cremation chamber during the cremation process. After the cremation is complete, the cremated remains are placed with the tag in a wooden urn engraved with your loved one's name. We will schedule a time for you to receive the cremated remains in a dignified setting where you may spend a few private moments for a quiet time of reflection. The final step in our cremation process is the celebration of life. In order to properly celebrate the life of your loved one, you will have many opportunities to personalize this service, from a dove release to a reception where refreshments are served. This provides a time for family and friends to pay tribute to your loved one and to share the memories of a lifetime. So you can see that the uh, family here at the Lake Ridge is certainly interested in making sure they do things the right way in the way that will benefit all the families that, uh, that come through the doors here um, on the worst day of their life to take care of a loved one. Lake Ridge Chapel and Memorial Designers was designed to not only service families choosing burial services, but also those choosing cremation services. This evening, we will take a brief look at the actual cremation process. As we open the loading door, we see inside the cremation chamber, which is made up of fire brick and a high temperature cement. The control panel is set for each specific case, depending on weight and the type of container being cremated. The temperature control is an advanced thermostat that regulates the flow of gas to the burner to maintain desired temperatures, which maximizes the operating efficiency. Here we see the primary chamber where the cremation actually takes place, a refractory surrounding with inputs of heat and air. Located in the rear of the chamber is the afterburner, which adds heat. Prior to loading the chamber, there will be a preheat cycle of 15 to 20 minutes. Following the preheat cycle, the loading door is then opened and the cremation container or casket is then placed into the chamber by an electric loading device. 
The door is closed and the cremation burner is turned on and this process will take about three hours. Small adjustments will be made to ensure that all inputs of heat and air are running at optimum performance. Within 20 minutes, the cremation chamber will have reached its highest level to, of temperature. When the cremation cycle has been completed, a cool down time is required to allow the equipment to cool to a safe temperature. This time period is very important for the operator's safety. Once the cremation chamber has had an opportunity to cool down, the loading door is opened and the operator will sweep the recoverable human remains into a metal pan which is located beneath the door. An additional and very important step is the vacuuming of the remaining remains and particles to reduce the risk of any co-mingling. With today's industry standards, vacuuming is not required after each case. However, we feel that it is of the utmost importance that the cremation chamber be as clean as possible for each client. Once the contents of the vacuum are added to the metal pan, it is then carried over to the processing station. A heavy duty magnet is used to remove any metal that is remaining and is then discarded. The final step of the process is pulverization, which reduces the bone fragments to granulated particles that are commonly referred to as cremated remains. Once the processing is completed, the cremated remains will then be placed into an urn. Following that, the urn is placed into our ceremonial room and is now ready to be received back to their family. I'm going to talk about why funerals are so important, but first, I want to start with a story from Dr. Wolfelt. He's a renowned grief psychologist He's also the one that uh, put together these posters that I'll be referring to in my next little deal. But Dr. Wolfelt overheard an adult son at a funeral. He said, this is what he overheard the son say, Dad is dead. We don't need a casket for his body. We're just going to create, cremate him and be done with this. We will just scatter him into the winds. This, this made Dr. Wolfelt think about a story that was told to him by a spiritual teacher called, named Ram Das. Now, I don't know who that guy is. Some of you may. But the story goes like this. An old man is too weak to work in the garden or to help with household chores. He sits on the porch, gazing out across the fields, watching his son till the soil, pull the weeds. Well, one day... The son looks up and he sees his dad sitting there doing nothing. And he says to himself, look at that old man doing nothing except eating up all the food. I have a wife and children I need to think about. It's time for him to be done with life. So the son makes a large wooden box, puts it on a wheelbarrow, rolls it up to the porch, and tells his father, get in. So, he lies down in the casket. The son hammers the lid on it and starts to wheel, the, wheel it toward the cliff. He hears a knock on the, in, from the inside of the box. Yes, father, asks the son. And the father says, why don't you just throw me over the cliff? Because your children may need this box someday. <laughs> You know, as cremation becomes more prevalent, uh, becomes more and more prevalent in today's society, the box is becoming less and less important. Many families no longer value caskets or maybe even the service. Most families look beyond that and just want to look at, let's do what's going to be quick and easy. You know what today's mantra is, quicker, easier, cheaper, faster. Well, 
we happen to know because we're in the business of taking care of people at one of the most difficult times in their life when it comes to funerals that cheaper faster and easier are generally much less effective at helping grieving families embark on a healthy path to healing. Now for the next 15 minutes or so, maybe I'll talk fast, um, I want to talk about the who, what, how, and why of funeral planning with an emphasis, let me find out which side it's on, on why, okay? So you got to look at these things all day and we just didn't have them there to look pretty. Um, this section is going to equip you with the knowledge to make informed choices about your own plans and the why for your family. Now before we get to the who, what, and how, let's talk about the six primary reasons why we've celebrated funerals since the beginning of time. If you remember earlier I talked about the history. I mean, even cavemen were burying people or cremating, they were doing something. There's a natural instinct in people of why we do these things. The foundation of the pyramid is reality. When you have a funeral, there is a reality that something big has happened. Someone has died. We accept it with our heads, but over time, do we come to accept it with our hearts? Without this realization, we cannot move forward with our grief. We have to accept the reality that something has changed. A funeral service allows us the time to recall, to share memories, uh, to, to uh, talk in about the, the loved one who just passed away, share stories, you know, sometimes you go to a funeral and you see people laughing or you see people crying. You know, both of these emotions are important for a funeral service because stories are often a way that people will show their support to the survivors of how this person, how their life mattered and affected me. So. The reality is, is how did this person affect the others that you knew or that knew your children? And it helps you to recall the person and the fact that you speak of them now in the past tense will also emphasize the reality that they are gone. Now, funerals are also help to bring people together to love and support each other. It is the funeral home or something that is organized that you can have friends and friends of your survivors come to show their support. You know, funerals are, are a remembrance of the person who has died. They're, they're for the remembrance of them, but they are for the survivors. A dedicated time and place to support and to grieve is created by setting up an event, whether it's in your, at a funeral home, at a church, at the cemetery. So those are things that help to support, you know, create support during a funeral service. Expression, when we grieve but don't mourn, our sadness can become unbearable. Grieve, mourn, what's the difference? Grieving is the internal thoughts we have when someone we care about dies. Mourning consists of the outward expressions of those thoughts and feelings. The funeral gives us a place to bring these two separate parts together to become whole again. Because if we grieve without mourning, there's always going to be that one thing that's left that needs to happen for us to start healing. Now perhaps these expressions lead us to better understand the meaning of that person's life. You know, why did their life matter? Why did it matter to me? And why does their death matter? So these are questions and things that will allow you to think about how that, that person impacted you. Now the top of the 
of this pyramid is the word transcendence. Now transcendence means to change or to be changed. How many of you think that life changes after you lose someone? I think most everybody should raise their hand. But how do you make sure that it is in a healing way? A lot of these things are necessary parts of a service or of a healing process. Now, funerals trigger thoughts of what is important to us. It reminds us of how precious life is and how now, although our lives have changed, we can begin the process of healing. Now, there are really no simple explanations, but funerals do give us a place to hold these questions in our hearts and to begin to find answers that will give us peace. Now, now that we've kind of looked at why we have funerals through reality, you know, ex accepting that, recalling that person's life, supporting each other, expression, a place to express your grief, meaning, finding an understanding in what's happened and how your life's changed, and ultimately transcending, what we want to look at now is how. How do we achieve these things? How does this happen? Does it just happen magically? No. Let me refer to this chart right here um, of the key elements that along with the understanding of the why we have funerals will resu result in a well-planned and meaningful healing service. Now, these are the main elements, and I think most of you probably will recognize, and it may be hard to read. Oh, it's up there too. Good. Um, but this is what we call the heart of the funeral. Okay? Now, starting at the bottom, there's actions, gathering, symbols, eulogy, remembrance, visitation, uh, reception, music, readings. When any one of these elements is omitted because we uh, want to make it easier on our family, or I just want to be done quickly, or I just want to have something basic, we are truly confusing efficiency with effectiveness. Sadly, efficiency is not always very effective. And in the case of death, can result in what, what Dr. Wolfelt refers to as complicated or unresolved grief. This can have profound effect on some individuals. Maybe not all, but some people will carry that with them until they learn or know how to deal with it. So, how do these elements, these elements tie together with why do we have funeral services? And these different parts of the service. Now, let me use it as an example, music, for instance. Music, usually music um, is used to set the mode or the mood, right? It can create emotion. Um, music typically, typically stirs up emotions and in the case of a funeral ceremony, they're usually a normal and necessary expression of grief. How many times in a service do you think about a song that's being played and say, that's them? You know, How often do we choose or think about our own service and say, you know what, if it's mine, I'm going to have this song? And believe me, they get a little of everything at the funeral home because people have different tastes. And it's a reflection of who that person is. It's been said, too, that music often will join or unify the mourners, the people together, so that they can all come together, and if they're singing, um, they can express themselves through music. I do want to share a story of a friend that um, how music actually impacted her and her family at the time of, the fa of her father's funeral. So the mother of my friend, or our fr a friend of ours, she had Alzheimer's for nearly 10 years. And her mom, she barely spoke, much less full sentences, not eloquent, and almost no emotions. And yet at her dad's funeral, when the dad died, the mother was there during the reflective singing of the Lord's Prayer. She sang along with the soloist and was crying 
you know, because, because of her beloved husband of 62 years. You know, music did this even to a woman with late stages of Alzheimer's who turned to her daughter and she said, I don't know why I'm crying. You see, her head didn't know. Her head didn't know, but her heart knew why she was crying. And so did her daughter. But that is how some of these elements come into play. Music tied with the why because it, sometimes your head doesn't understand what your heart needs to say or vice versa. So my friend's mom felt it in her heart without understanding why. She couldn't understand or articulate, but her daughter knew the reason. Now let's consider actions. It's here at the bottom. You know, mourners often don't know what to do with their grief. And sometimes our words are inadequate. How many times do we not know what to say? Well, a lot of families turn to rituals or physical actions to involve the people, their friends, their family. Maybe they're vocalists. Maybe they're pallbearers. Maybe they're eulogists. Maybe they're singing. Maybe they're, they're doing something, but it gives them a way to be a part of the funeral service and it helps them through their grieving process by being able to give to the family. That is another part of them being able to express and support the family and express their grief in their own way. Because a lot of sometimes at funerals people try not to cry maybe. But you know, um, there are things that, they, that can be done to help them through their own grief in their own way. Now remember, while your funeral may be about you, it's for your survivors. <coughs> now, we could take apart each and every one of these little elements and say, how does this tie into why we have funerals? I think you can look at those and see, you know, how these elements will help either with meaning or, or expression or support or recall or the reality of what's happened. But there are two ways that you can take a look at how you should address the who, what, how, and why we have funerals. There's two ways, I, th I think there's, keep it simple, there's two ways. Number one, you can leave all this for your survivors. Do nothing. And on one of the worst days of their life, in an emotional state, they can come into the funeral home and answer a lot of questions at a very difficult time and try to plan a service. That's one way you can do it and some people do that. Another way is to sit down with a professional like Laura, she's around somewhere. Um, what she does is she sits down with people and during that she helps to explain the who, what, how, and the why that you can plan your service so that when your children need to take care of your services, they know what your wishes are. You've communicated that information to them. So, these two ways of taking care of your funeral, I, Mark Childs will go into a little bit more detail in a little bit, but in closing, I wanna go back to the story I shared with you earlier about the lady, um, a friend who had Alzheimer's, her mom had Alzheimer's, and it's because of this story why I do what I do to help families and why I love the profession I'm in because I understand how valuable it is to help people. But my friend I shared about earlier, she and her father did go, you know, because of her mom's Alzheimer's, they did go down to the funeral home and plan the mother's funeral in advance. She and her dad, they met with a, a licensed professional and planned out everything. And even the dad even decided, I'm just gonna go ahead and pay for it. He did that. Now, the funeral director um, did not suggest, or the funeral profession did not, ex and I think it was just a funeral director. They didn't have their own staff to just meet with families. It was a funeral director. But he did not recommend that the father do his service, his pre-planned service. Quite frankly, they felt certain that mom with her late stages of Alzheimer's would be the first to need funeral services. Well, five and a half months later, dad dies of a heart attack. So, 
they had nothing planned and most of the money that they had was used up by take the continuous care of the mother with Alzheimer's so the children had to pitch in and pay for the dad's service or at least the ones that had the money to do that so three and a half months after the dad's funeral unfortunately the mother did die from the, her late stages and her condition and although their hearts were broken they did have the logistical and the financial things taken care of because they went in and did that. They didn't have to change anything, except they did change one thing. They made a change to have the same soloist sing the Lord's Prayer. And they all sang along and wept just like their mother did for their father. So don't wait to do this. It's something that you need to get the process started, at least get it written down. You know, a funeral that allows you and your family to express their grief and mourn the loss is one that allows them to transcend, to change, to be changed, to accept the change that has happened in their life. It helps your family to realize that their lives <clears throat> changed, but that because your life mattered, so does your death, and why you deserve to be remembered. So they deserve a well-planned and healing funeral. just briefly go back to reality because in the video that you saw earlier about our cremation with confidence guarantee we talk about the family viewing for identification in there and I think that with cremation minded families that a lot of times I have people in the pre need arrangements that just come in and say I just want to be cremated I don't I don't want anyone to see me I just want to be cremated but, but there is a sense of reality in, in seeing our deceased loved one, to know that that is in fact a real thing, that it really did happen. I'd like to quote Dr. Wolfelt as saying, not only is the dead body proof for our logical mind, it is a means of transition for our searching heart, which so much longs to still be with the person we love. And I think that it is very important, even if you don't choose a public viewing for yourself, you at least need that private family viewing for identification because it's, it's so much more than that. It is a, we, don't, we don't know what our death is going to look like. And, and I'm telling you, being in this industry, I've seen a lot of death. And it isn't always peaceful and comforting. Even if we have an opportunity to pass away uh, gracefully with, with our, surrounded by our family and friends, it's still not always pretty. So to be able to have a time where your immediate family has the opportunity to come in and spend some time with you in a more comfortable, peaceful setting and to be able to say their goodbyes, there's a lot of value in that for them long term especially. The family viewing for identification is just something to ponder. On the back of your agenda, I actually um, I photocopied a, an article there called Cremation with Confidence, the Power of Closure and Celebration. And it was an article that I wrote that was featured in Senior Link Magazine in spring of this year. And it's, it's worth the read. Just, just take a look at that. So how many of you have been to services here in our chapel? Show of hands. Oh, y'all are gonna make this real easy for me. <laughs> I thought we would go through. I want to show you how our signature services, because if you look at this, this requires a lot of work on the family's part if you don't do anything about it. So to help you out, our signature services 
are, were designed, uh, they were designed before Wolfelt ever created the chart. Santos and Leanne put our signature services into play when these stores opened 11 years ago. And so after seeing Dr. Wolfelt's chart, I'm assuming that great minds think alike. I think through years of serving families that they have come to know what the family needs. So they've done the hard part for you. You just need to fill out a thoughtful decision guide. We're going to take a look at a couple of these. So, so let's, start with, let's start with music. Our live tribute DVD, part of our signature services, we take that music and we add those photographs that provoke those memories and we take a journey back in time with that. Speaking of music, um, all of you have your pen and paper. Has anybody written down questions on that at all? Some of you? What I want you to do for me right now on that, on that pad, I want you to take just a brief moment and write down what your life theme song would be. And I don't want you to take them with you. I want you to leave them on the table because I want to read them later. So let's move on to, to readings. Uh, memorial folders. I think it's really special if you put a personal message in your memorial folder. These are all of the things that you need to think about. Catered visitations. When, with our visitations being catered, it allows us to break bread together and it, it forms a sense of unity and strength. Did you all enjoy your bread breaking this evening? Good. Okay, eulogy and remembrance. Now, I have a lot of cremation families especially that, that struggle with this. Some burial families, sometimes, no matter what disposition we choose, I get people in the pre-planning uh, meetings and they'll say, well, I don't have a church home, I don't have a minister. And I understand that services, a lot of the times, have spiritual and religious undertones and, and things like that, but it's really the celebration of you. So no matter what, what your story is, it's, it's your celebration and you have it however you want to have it. Maybe you don't want to have a traditional service. Maybe you want to have an open mic service. Maybe you want to have a roast. Maybe some of you who are afraid of the stories that people might tell should write your own eulogy. <laughs> Um, I encourage everyone to write their own obituary. You can be whoever you want to be. Dr. Greg Hoblock wrote a, wrote a book. Did y'all know that? His obituary would say that. Um, symbols. Memorial table or the memory table. I can't tell you the things we have seen on memory tables. Things that make you look at it and go, what is that? But it, it's, it's depictive of that person's life. It tells that person's story. So all of these things are symbolic. Thumbies, memory glass for, for our cremation families. Some of your family members might want to have your thumbprint forever etched in a piece of jewelry. Um, some of your remains preserved in, in a piece of memory glass. All of these are symbolic of your life together and they create a sense of, of, of a connection still after someone has passed. Our aftercare programs. Okay, so this is in the gathering element of the service. Our facility, when Leanne says that it was designed with cremation and burial families in mind, that is an understatement. It was designed with people in mind, with families in mind, so we have enormous amounts of space to host gatherings such as these, so you can see that family luncheons wouldn't be a problem, correct? Our ceremonial room off of the side of our crematory, it kind of bridges the gap between cremation and, and burial-minded people because sometimes when we choose cremation, our families may not really be on board with that and they need that closure of the committal service so that ceremonial room was designed for just that. Um, we have so many non-death related events here. Leanne's daughter was married here. My daughter had her high school graduation party here. We have Bible studies here, all kinds of things. But I wanna talk about under the gathering part, and I'm gonna read this from over here because I'm totally lost on these. I should just throw them in the air. 
the, the gathering part is, is for us to gather to share what's on our minds and in our hearts and to continue to support one another after a death has occurred. Our aftercare programs here are second to none, and I want to share just a little bit about these with you. Because our, our aftercare programs are not limited to the families that we serve, they, they are for the public as well. So whether you have used our funeral home in the past, plan to use it, don't ever plan to use it, you're still welcome to take part in our aftercare services. How many Lake Ridge ladies do I have here? Wonderful. Well, these gals can tell you, uh, that group started out with five members that Santos took to dinner uh, about, well, 11 years ago. And he realized during that meal that what they needed was each other, not necessarily him. And so he backed out of it and the group continued to grow and grow and grow. And now there's over 600 of them um, they have monthly dinners, they come here, they play hand and foot and bunco, they travel, they do community service work. They're actually now a full uh, scale nonprofit organization. It's just a beautiful sisterhood. And I'm looking at one of our beauties right now. Sorry, I keep glancing down at you. Our, okay, so our Lake Ridge gentleman, still a work in progress. <laughs> Men grieve just a little bit differently than women do. They don't really want you to scoop them up and love on them. They like some quiet time to, the, to themselves. Santos went back when he started the Lake Ridge Ladies and it took off like it did. He tried to get a gentleman's group together with a brunch. I did have a gentleman in a pre-planning uh, arrangement tell me one time, well, if you had pizza and beer not, we'd all show up. <laughs> So it's, it's a thought, still a work in progress and hopefully we'll have something together for, for you guys soon. Walking Through Grief is a generalized grief care uh, class. It's a 10 week series and it is open for anyone who has suffered a loss of any kind. Hope for the Hurt Heart is a specialized grief class. It is for parents who have lost children because that's a different complexity of grief, so they do have their own group. Now, I'll tell you what was happening in these, in these grief care programs. People were forming friendships, and when the class was over, they didn't want the friendship to end, so what, what happened was we had a lot of repeat offenders that would come back and take it again, just so they could be close to their friends. So we decided that we would implement a group called HOME, which meets once a month. And they have a, a monthly dinner where they can continue these friendships that they built in these classes. So once you've completed Walking Through Grief or Hope for the Hurt Heart, we fondly welcome you home. I also want to touch base on the educational series that you are at right now. I hope that all of you are enjoying these. I've had a lot of people that have been here with me since day one, and they never, they never miss. And I appreciate all of you very much. So is, is it everyone learning something tonight? Yeah. Yes, good. Okay, so we're going to get down to actions here. So actions. Uh, Dove release. We do release two doves at all of our graveside services and after all of the memorial services held here in our chapel, sometimes people choose to release butterflies or they take balloons and they write special personal messages on them. It's just whatever your heart desires and sky's the limit literally. So um, Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you a little bit about our signature services and how they line up with Wolfelt's chart over here. Um, I, I wanted to say this too, you know, the other funeral homes in town, they have been in business for 100 years. We've been here only 11 years and we continue to get best of Lubbock and best of the West. And I want to think that that is because we are not just about death and helping people journey through that process, but I like to think that we're about life <coughs> and that the activities and events and things that we offer are about 
supporting you through, through the journey of life. With, with these educational series, I feel like it's information that we obtain today that we can use tomorrow. So we're hoping that we're preparing you for the journey ahead. I saw hands of folks that have been to services here before earlier. There were a lot of them. And um, how many of you have been responsible for making arrangements for someone that's passed away? Oh, almost as many that have been here. Okay. So, um, so some of y'all are going to be familiar with what we're going to go through. And hopefully you can help me to make sure I don't forget something along the way here. Um, because we know that um, as you came here this evening, how many of you told your neighbors and your friends and your family you were coming here to the funeral home to learn, learn about death? <laughs> few? Few? Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and the good thing is you were coming to just talk about it, right? Okay. So, um, so we can't beat that, can we? That's a, that's a good thing. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we can all walk away this evening as well. So um, one of the things that we uh, like to talk about is we, as you came up here and you were looking at things, um, it was very important that you came here to learn about the importance of prearranging funerals, talking about it, and sharing with your family that information. And the reason that's important is because you came up here because you wanted to this evening and also you got to eat a little bit as well, right? But when something happens to you, your families are going to come up here in a whole different frame of mind. Not because they want to, but because they have to. And so that's why it's important for us to take care of things and to talk about what that scenario is going to be like when they get here. Because when they come in here, they're, they're going to be searching for answers, looking for things that can help them with your service so that they can do things according to the way you want. We've touched on a lot of that this evening, but I'm going to go through a little process here to kind of give you an idea of what they're going to face if we do nothing this evening. If you do nothing this evening, what are they going to face? Well, as they come walking in that door and they meet the funeral director and they sit down with the funeral director back in the arrangement room, they're going to be asked, questions. Is it one question? Two questions? It's a whole bunch of questions. Everything that you didn't want them to ever share with anyone about you. And um, so the first thing that they're going to ask when they come in, <clears throat> funeral director is going to ask them, when do you want to have the service, the date and the time? That's the first thing. Then the second thing that he's going to ask is, what type of service do you want? Is it going to be a chapel? How about a graveside? I'm going to abbreviate some things if y'all don't mind. And, um, or perhaps a cremation. Okay. Then he's going to ask, so do you want to have that service if it's at the chapel? Is it going to be at the chapel or is it going to be at the church? Then they're going to ask, who's going to be the minister? Can you see over here again? Okay. <laughs> um, so they're going to ask about the minister. Okay. Then they're going to ask, uh, do you have any pallbearers? Try and get my spelling correct over here. Any English teachers? No. <laughs> Pay no attention to the bad handwriting, right? Um, all right, so they're going to ask about the pallbearers. Then they're going to ask, so um, we got the minister down here, we got the pallbearers down here. Are there going to be flowers? And uh, will there be uh, a notice in the newspaper? <clears throat> then they're going to be asking, we've got these nice caskets up here, so do you want a casket? And if the answer is yes, you want a casket, then okay. So do you want a bronze? How about a copper? Perhaps mom and dad really liked wood. They had that special 
material there at the end, their, their dining room sets and their bedroom sets were all, oh, was it maybe pecan, oak, maybe cherry. As you can see, a lot of questions that start coming into play here. If they're going to go with the steel, is that going to be stainless? Perhaps an 18 gauge or a 20 gauge? Just a few questions. We haven't even got to the obituary notice. We really haven't even gotten to all the vital statistic information, which they're going to have to have all that. You got obit here, and then you got the um, vital statistics. On and on they're going to go. Now, music. Oh, thank you so much. I forgot about that music. What kind of music? Country and Western? Rock and roll? Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> well, you got several options with all the different musicians that have been here in the uh, Lubbock area, so you can kind of kind of select from from some of all that. So um, so we have just a number of things that have to, to be selected. And for the sake of time, because we can go on for the hour and a half to two hours to up to three hours that a funeral director sits down with that family because they didn't know anything. And the final question that's going to come up is this one. How are you going to pay for it? So first, how much is it? <laughs> how much is it? And then how are you going to pay? That's right. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So as we go through this process, and I just do this to kind of give you an idea of the questions that come up. If you're not there in the picture, which you wouldn't be, if you haven't made any decisions, which perhaps you didn't, then these are the questions and this is just the surface of what they're going to have to go through at the time. And so rather than just worrying about the grief of, of the loss of their loved one, now they're having to figure out how to deal with the financial aspect of it and all the other decisions that have to be made. How much easier would it be if we took the time to write down that information to take care of even setting it up so that we could pay it out so that the family doesn't have to worry about it at the time? Because then what question is left when they walk up to that door and they're in a grief state, <clears throat> and all my markers are going to come out here in just a second, How much easier would it be if they just had the question, when's the date and the time? Mom and dad took care of everything. Mom and dad took care of everything. Well, we need to do it on this time. Okay, good. And guess what? It's already paid for. You don't have to worry about it. Really? Wow, mom and dad were better than I thought. <laughs> And how much better it is when they don't have to worry about that. Now here's the, question, the, the, the main part of it. Remember we talked about earlier about whether it's cremation or burial, what have you. You've made that decision. The director just has to carry out the wishes that were written down and set up for the family. So that's not their decision now. That was your decision. So which makes more sense? To leave this for your family? Or to do this. Most people opt for this one if they have a have a say so, because remember I talked about that fam my family earlier. Well, I got an aunt that she's going. Oh, I'm going to leave all that up to my kids. And I'm thinking, Aunt Maxine, you don't love the kids, do you? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, there's a lot to get even with there. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so we can see that there's, a, there's a, a very important reason for us to do this ahead of time and to take care of helping our families. And uh, I'm going to go briefly over one little form that they've got here at, the, uh, at Lake Ridge that um, Laura would be more than happy to sit down with you and to go over this just to kind of get you started. It's called a Thoughtful Decision Planner. And um, I, don't, I don't think you have a copy of this in there, but she will be more than happy 
Well, she ran off to the back. Okay. Hey, Laura. <laughs> Um, I'll just start off with the, with the information that's on here to kind of give you an idea of what you can do with this little piece of paper. Well, it's four pages worth, right? But only three of them are really, the front one's already printed on, so you don't have to worry about that one. You might color it, but that's it. Um, all right, so starting from the back, this whole page is set up so that you can put your wishes down how you want your funeral to be. I mean, you can go through the type of gathering, private family, visitation with a, or a wake or um, open casket, closed casket, memorial book, um, videos, all sorts of different things that you can put down on here, how you want your service, who the minister is going to be, what church you would like to, to go to or uh, have the service at or any of the information in here. Your clothing, do you really want them picking out your clothes? <laughs> Think about it, ladies. <laughs> and then, of course, you have, um, uh, do you want your glasses on or off? It makes a difference. My grandfather, he was in a casket. They didn't have his glasses on. It didn't look like him. So I called the funeral director. Hey, we need the glasses. Made a big difference. Made a big difference. And uh, so there's just little things. And uh, like for the veterans, how do you want the flag? Do you want it just kind of off to the side, or do you want the casket draped with the, with the flag? So a lot of things that you can do ahead of time, even selecting the pallbearers and listing those down, how you, you know, who, who that would be, and even honorary pallbearers. Um, a lot of us have friends that they're up in years along with us, and guess what? They're not going to be able to carry the casket, but they can be honorary pallbearers. You might remember John McCain's. There were some honorary pallbearers with his service. And... Um, so you just kind of keep in, in those types of things in mind. And one thing I ask families to do, or individuals to do even, think about a funeral that you have attended or seen that impacted you. And what was it about that funeral that impacted you? And is that something that you would like to see your family have at your funeral? And you'd be surprised when you start thinking about what you've seen and how it would affect your family and really help them to get through this, this process um, of, uh, of grieving and dealing with, their, with their, the loss of their loved ones. And if it's done this way, they can take that time to grieve and reflect and, and talk about the good times, the memories, and, and that sort of thing instead of worrying about all these other deals. When you get to the inside part, then there's a spot down at the bottom where you can list your insurances, what they're for. Um, I tell you, there's nothing worse than a family coming to the funeral home thinking, because mom said they always had a, an insurance policy. And they come and they find out, well, when they went to the nursing home, it kind of lapsed. They couldn't take care of it any longer. But if you have that information listed down and your family knows where this is, when things get critical, they can know what to look for. And it kind of becomes a roadmap for them on how to help with your service. And then, of course, you have the place to, to list those who have, um, uh, that, that uh, family members that uh, passed away before you, uh, to list those. This really helps the funeral director with regard to putting together, helping with the obituary notice. And then family and friends that need to be contacted. How many times is there that one person and all of us have them, perhaps. I know I do. Friends that the family doesn't even know about. Friends that live off in other states in different areas. Well, if I don't list it on here, do they know to call that person? No. No. And, uh, and there's, you know, friends that we've just grown up with and, you know, we've kind of separated. They've moved off different ways or what have you. But this way, you kind of help to, to the family to, to know who to reach out to. Nothing worse than a... You have the funeral and you're, everybody's gathered, you know, back at the house or, or uh, at a gathering place or facility where they uh, got together to, to have a catered meal or something and all of a sudden, oh, we forgot so-and-so. That's too late. It's already done, right? And, um, and there's no way they can even get there. But that really helps in, with... Um, with the family and, um, and even the funeral director putting things together. And you can even list who you want to be responsible for taking care of your arrangements. You can designate who that, that go-to person is. 
because there's some family members we don't want, right? <laughs> and there's one, you say, ah, you know, she'll take care of everything the way it's supposed to be, the way I want it to be. Um, then we have, of course, an area here where you can put how long you've been in the area, your work history, things of that nature, what organizations and churches you belong to. Um, again, that all helps the funeral director and the family to know who to contact, who to, to get with. Can't tell you how sad it is when families come in and, and um, they don't even have a clue what minister to get. Well, mom never talked about it. Dad never talked about it. And it's sad. It's sad when, when they just don't know who to reach out to and where to go. This is a map that will really help your family. And then finally, your vital statistics. Well, guess what? When a death occurs, some of these numbers, social security numbers, who your grandparents were, well, was it me, Ma, and Papa? <laughs> Where were they born? Yeah. Don't even know what their names were, so <laughs> how can you figure out where they were born? And um, so all that information, putting down who your parents are, where they were born, what state or, or what have you, can be a very helpful to the family. And more importantly, this information will be accurate and correct because this is the information right here that they use to get the death certificates. And without that information, nothing happens. Insurance policies don't get processed through. Social Security stuff, of course, the funeral director will contact them, but there's, there's so many things that have to have a death certificate, property-wise and things of that nature, and most people, you know, they, they just kind of go through thinking everything's okay until that day, and then they find out all of a sudden everything they've got has been shut down. Well, do you have death certificates? No. Come back when you do. So... It, this information, I can't tell you how vital it is to have this. So hopefully this little exercise will help you to, to be able to, to kind of move forward and um, make sure your family doesn't experience some of the challenges. And maybe some of you have had that, that very experience that we've talked about where you came to the funeral home and had no clue what, what was going on and you were looking for answers yourself. So one of the things I want to talk about and take about one minute, but a lot of people ask the question, so this kind of fits into the how do we take care of funeral services. Pre-arranging is part of that. Pre-planning is what Mark was talking about. But oftentimes people say, well, can I go ahead and pay for it? Kind of like my friend that the family did for the mother who had Alzheimer's. They pre-paid for it. Well, the way that there are ways to do that. Obviously, if that's something you want to do, once you go through this process, you know what the service is. You know what the costs are because you sat down and they said, here's what it would come out to be because everybody's service will be different. And once they find that out, some people, they don't want to be in debt, so they just write a check and they're done. It's decided, it's paid for, all done. Now, we also know that not everybody can do that, and they do have ways you can pay for a funeral ahead of time. You know, a lot of times at a service they say, can I make payments on my father's or my mother's? They don't allow that because... It's just, it just doesn't work for funeral homes. There's not a lot of repercussion once they quit paying. There's not a lot you can do about it. So um, I, I'm avoiding saying there's no repossessions involved. So, but, <laughs> but, but, but families can go in ahead of time and set up a plan and make monthly payments and pay it off before it's ever needed. So those are a couple of things that families can do um, when they look at the how to plan a meaningful funeral. Welcome, we are so glad y'all are here tonight and thank you for spending your time with us. I am Shannon Dawn with Batesville Casket and um, I am a licensed, like he said, a licensed funeral director and embalmer. Um, I absolutely love my families. I'm from a little bitty town and so I know everybody and I know they're everybody and they're everybody. So that, that uh, really draws you in. But they asked me today to come and talk to y'all and explain some of the merchandise that you have to choose from. And uh, when someone says to me, I just want cremation, and I go, okay, well, that's disposition, that's not services. Um, that's going to be disposition being, are you going to go to the crematory, are you deciding, like they said earlier tonight, um, are you going to go 
to the cemetery. So cremation, of course, you're going to the crematory, and so there are certain things that we're going to look through and talk through so you understand what all your choices are. And um, I like to say also when they're just saying, I just want to be cremated, I say, okay, well, what are we going to do about our services and where, where would you like to have them? And they always say to me, it always amazes me, we can do that? <laughs> I go, well, yeah, of course you can. So um, that's what I'm here to do is explain what your choices of your merchandise are. And they're passing out some brochures right now and there's enough for every one of y'all to get one. So this will take just a minute or two. And as they're passing them all out, be sure that you get, that you get one. Um, and I never ever, and they don't either, want to sell you anything. Honestly, I know people think that, but it's not. Our whole job is to explain to you and educate you. So this is a very large purchase. It's like one of our largest purchases that we make, you know, than a car or we, we put more time into picking out our refrigerator than we do on being informed about this decision. So um, I think it's really huge to educate. So when you get here to the funeral home, you feel in control. You don't feel like a victim and you don't feel like you don't know what you're talking about. So they're very good about explaining all of that to you, which they've done over tonight. Um, so you do feel really, really good about when you leave this building, you feel good about what your selections are. Um, some of the things that, like they talked about earlier, that you need to decide is if you're going to have a church service. If you do choose a church service, then you're going to need to get some type of container that would be suitable to be carried to the church. This particular unit here is one of our rental units. This is a cherry, we have several. This is considered a rental unit, and when they say that, I know that sounds kind of strange, but when you lift this up, and I'll be happy to show anybody how this works, um, the whole inside of this is one unit, so never ever is it reused. Once you are placed into this unit and it's time for you to go to the crematory, the end of this opens up and there's rollers on the bottom here and the whole unit, all the interior and everything go with you into the crematory. So once you're laid in here, you are not disturbed or fished out or whatever word you can use. Sorry. Um, that whole unit literally goes into the crematory. Um, this other unit that is over here, this is what in, in our merchandising, this is called a standard. That's the name of it. When you look into this cremation book, you will see this unit in this book. Um, that particular unit here would not be suitable to be taken to a church. Um, it would be suitable, of course, many times as a family ID, as a viewing, if you select uh, viewing and then memorial service, or it would be suitable to be used here at Lake Ridge Chapel. And then this unit is taken to the crematory. Um, of course, all these different urns, um, if you have any questions about any of them, urns are interesting to be memorialized. Uh, we talked about burial, we talked about memorial urns. You have to think beyond today, though. You have to think about what's your granddaughter going to do with this urn? What's your great-granddaughter going to do with this urn? I can't tell you. Uh, I have owned a funeral home for many, many years, uh, 25 years, and I've had several calls from people cleaning out houses, and they found urns, and they didn't know what to do with them. Bring them to me. We'll take care of them. Does anybody need a catalog? So um, there's all different kinds of urns. There's keepsakes from even this particular unit here is, can be a single where you can put some of the cremated remains in here. It also seconds as a topper. It actually goes on this unit or it goes on this wood unit or it goes by itself. There's so many choices. It's crazy how many choices there are. You've got the, the books though to be looking what all, all of them are. Um, you can put them in jewelry. You can, I mean, nowadays, like Laura said earlier, you can turn them into diamonds. You can, 
You can shoot it up into the sky and it can float in orbit in, in the universe. You can do all kinds of things. I actually even had a family, believe this, I'm not kidding, because we are in Texas, <laughs> take, you know how you load your own gunshot? They did. I'm not kidding. They did. I'm not kidding. Anyway, so you can just take that and, and, and uh, know where that was going. But the bottom line is you have lots of choices. And they're choices that I like to tell people when I work with families ahead of time and not at, at need. I like to say, you make those choices and include your family if you want to include your family but you make those choices. And they're choices made when you can laugh about it, when you can talk about it, when you healthily can walk to the other side. That's what it's about. And that's really pretty much all that I have to talk about tonight. So if you have any questions, I'm gonna stand up here for a little bit and you've got your books and look through them and uh, we will get through it. Thank you very much.